Lord Jesus Christ will come back and we're going to see every element of it. He's going to come back uh, and, and those that are alive are going to go to meet Him in the air if they're believers. So you will not experience physical death. That's the part of the mystery He's explained. We're not all going to sleep. We won't all die. That's what sleep means there. Uh, they're dead uh, in Christ. Not everybody will see a physical death. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, which we'll go to in a little while, the Bible says, uh, We which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Those that are alive. So not everybody is going to see death in this life. Then be in there under that part called the mystery. But all true believers will be changed. He says, we shall all be changed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And you wonder about the whole change thing. If you go back and read verse 35 through 50, you'll understand uh, the depth of why. But then he sums it up there in verse 53. Uh, in 54 about corruptible and incorruptible uh, and all. So that's the explanation of the change and why we're all going to be changed. Uh, hold your place there and turn over just a few pages forward to Philippians. Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3 verse 24. Conversation is in heaven. Conversation is another word for our life. Use life there. For our life is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So, what's Paul writing here to this church? He's writing to them that you're going to be changed. This body will be changed. This body's not going to make it into heaven. If I don't. Uh, go by the grave, then in that moment, in that instant, when the Lord comes and He calls, uh, this body will be changed. I'll be changed. I'll get that glorified uh, body. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But the change that takes place. First John chapter 3 and verse 2, you can write that down. The Bible says, uh, we'll be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We'll be changed in a moment. Our, our whole life, once you became a Christian, once you became a true follower of Jesus Christ, and you've heard me say this before, and this solidifies it, backs it up, underscores it, lays the foundation for it, whatever you want to say. If you're not changed, you're not saved. Amen. Because the Bible says that when you get born again, you are changed. You become a new creature in Christ. Amen. That transformation... It, ha it happens overnight, but it lasts the rest of your life. Okay? You're changing. You, you're, you're, you're not conforming to this world, Paul said in Romans 12, but you're being transformed daily by the renewing of your mind. You're growing in the Lord. You're growing closer to the Lord. I'm telling you, if you haven't given up anything since you got saved and you've been saved five or ten years, you might ought to check back and see if you got the goods. <laughs> if you're not different than you were when you got saved, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're not saved. You got a good dose of religion that makes you feel better, but you're just as lost as you ever been. And you're not going to get to make this trip I'm talking about today. Preacher, you're being mean. I'm not being mean. It's just time somebody told the truth. And we got a lot of people sitting in church for you thinking they're going to heaven and they're going to fast track to hell. They're not no more saved than them dogs out there who carry fleas. I'm telling you, you, this trip is a trip. You better know you're ready to go on. You, you can't just think that you're all right and get in. You're not going to get there. All right? All of us will be changed. Turn over there to Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. I can't get bogged down here. I'll never get through. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Bible says this, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. One preacher said one time, he was reading that, he said, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. <laughs> thought he was looking for a new church. But anyway, he said, I wouldn't have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Verse 18 says, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. If you've ever stood at a graveside, chances are you've probably heard these verses read before. Why? Because we have comfort in the resurrection. We have comfort in the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have comfort in knowing that He's not going to leave us in that grave, that body. But Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When, when we die, our spirit is present with the Lord. But we need that body. We can't just roam around in, in spirit entities with no body for all eternity. So at this rapture, when the rapture takes place, uh, under that all true believers will be changed, you could add this. Number one, the dead will be changed first. The dead will be changed first. Why? To get their spirit and their body back together. That new body is going to be raised, as Paul said there in 1 Corinthians, incorruptible. The corruption has to put on the incorruption. And that dead body over there, it's been decaying all them years, it's going to be resurrected from the dead and it's going to be changed. And we're going to see how all that happens next in that moment. It's going to be changed and it will be a glorified body like Christ has. Well, Jesus went through walls, didn't he? So they was eating one day in the room and he just showed up in the room. Well, we got to have a body like his so we can do what he does. So anytime you've walked around, bumped into the wall and hit this and dumped your head on something, once this happens, you won't have to worry about that no more. I'll be over you go right through the wall. The dead will rise first so that spirit and that body can be reunited. My spirit and my body are still together. If this rapture took place today, those graves over there, I don't know if they would open up or not. The Bible doesn't say that. You know, I've heard it preached. Gravestones going to tump over and the dirt's going to fly up. The coffin's going to fly up. Well, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. It could. It could make a good, you know, middle week movie or something. But it, whether they do or not, I don't know. But I can tell you this. Those that are in there are going to get up first. And then, I mean, just faster than you can think about after they get up, this body's going to change and be glorified all in an instant. And I'm going to be right behind them. To meet him in the air. Alright? That's the mystery that he's talking about. This thing called the rapture. That's the mystery. Here's the moment. Number two is the moment. The mystery. Everybody won't see physical death, but everybody will be changed. And then there in first Corinthians, he talks about a moment. Verse 52. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. I, speed's one of them things that's relative, you know. If you go to Talladega and, and you get in a race car and you drive around Talladega Super Speedway with no other cars on the racetrack, you run 150 miles an hour, there's not really a sensation of speed there because it's so big. I've, I've been up there and I've done that. Drove 150 something miles an hour around that racetrack, uh, and it's like driving 55 down the interstate. I mean, you wouldn't know the difference, literally, because it is so big. That track is so wide and so big. Speed is one of those things. It's hard to really to to understand it sometimes, except for the situation you're in. Now, when you're out there with 40 other cars, and you add about 50 more mile an hour to that. Uh, then you get the sensation of that speed that you're going. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? It's kind of a relative thing speed. In the moment, the Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye, A is in a moment. That's the duration. Eleven one hundredths of a second. I don't, I mean, you, you can't even click the stopwatch that fast. Eleven one hundredths of a second is what they say 
the blink of an eye is. I don't think the Bible says blink there, does it? I think it says twinkling. That's, that's not even closing and opening. A twinkle, somebody, something can catch your eye, can't it? Something can walk by. I mean, just in an instant, your eyes jerk open. That's the twink, the twinkle. Just, just that gesture of it caught my eye. That's how quick it's gonna happen. The duration of it, less than eleven one hundredths of a second, instantaneously. You might as well say that's unfathomable. We can't figure that out. It'd be under the moment, at the moment. Not only in a moment, the duration, but at the moment, the destination, at that moment. In that very moment, in that quickness, we'll be from here with Him in the air. The Jews, the Jews are a sign-seeking people. They look for signs. And people want to know today, they want to know signs. What, how do we know it's the end times? How do we know? Is, this, is the Lord coming back? Is this a sign of the end? Is this a sign? Of, there's a lot of signs that have to do with His second coming. There are no signs that have to do with the rapture. Not one. But it wouldn't it just make common sense that if we see signs that point to His second coming, the second coming, all these signs that we see point to this second coming, wouldn't it make sense that if those signs are what we're seeing now and there's a seven year period of time in between all that happening, and the rapture of the church, shouldn't we be thinking that, hey, maybe it's time for us to get ready to get out of here? Yes. We're, we're not looking for those signs. We're listening for a sign. So what does the Bible say there in Thessalonians? Jesus is coming what? With His own shout. I don't know what He's going to say. He may look over at the throne. Let's see. He, he's on the right hand, so he'll look to his left at God the Father, and he'll say, I'm tired of it now. I'm going to give him, and God might be caught off guard or something. I don't know. I don't, you all know I'm just teasing about that. <laughs> God's going to be sitting there, and, and Jesus might say, is it time I'm ready? And he might say, yeah, it's time. And he's going to say, hey, I'm coming. I don't know what he's going to shout. But he's going to shout something. Because the Bible says he is. With a shout, Jesus is coming. And with the voice of the archangel. I'm listening for the Lord to shout. I'm listening. Hey, I don't know if it'll be him. We all spend more time talking to him so you can identify him when he shouts. <laughs> Listen for him. He's going to shout the voice of the archangel. What's he going to say? I don't know. He may say, boys, y'all get ready. He's going to get them people. It's time. Because nobody knows when it's going to take place. Jesus said, no, not even the angels. Only the Father knows when it's time for the rapture to take place. Don't confuse the rapture and the second coming in Scripture. No indication of the rapture. It's going to happen one day. So we're, we're listening we're listening for Jesus. We're listening for the archangel. And what's that other thing we're listening for? The trumpet. The same. You, you, that trumpets, that's not, you can't mistake a trumpet for anything else. And you sure can't mistake that ram's horn for anything else. When, when whoever's going to blow it steps out over the guardrail of heaven to blow that thing, you're going to hear it. And he's going to say, come up hither. That's what the Bible says in Revelation. That may be what he says. Come on, I'm ready for you. And he's going to meet us. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we alive and remain will be caught up together with him. What? To meet him in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the rapture. It happens in a moment. It happens at that very moment. And we are with him when it takes place. And it all happens so fast. That the unbelievers, they won't know what happened. They won't even know something did happen until they get their senses back about it. Have you ever witnessed something like, like an automobile accident or something like that? Something 
you know, that happened in front, and you saw it, and I mean, it was over so fast, and you had to stop and think, what, what did I just see? What just happened? Ever been watching something on TV, maybe the news or something, and you, and you see something, and you think, did that, really, did that really just happen? Did I really just see that? On, there's some things that are so shocking now on TV that that's what you think. I can't believe I really saw that on television. Because I don't care anymore. It, that's the way it's going to be for the unbelief. It's going to happen so fast, they won't see it happen. It'll just be done. It's like right now. If it happened, if it happened in church, Lord help us if it happens in church. Because there's going to be people left sitting in pews. And all they're going to see is Bibles and clothes piled up on the pews. But they're not going to, they're not going to understand what just happened because they didn't see it happen. It happened so fast. In a moment. And at that moment, we'll be changed, we'll be gone, we'll be out of here. All that's going to happen so fast that we it'll just be done. And we'll be there. I mean, hey, beam me up, Scotty. That, that, it took them forever compared to what Jesus is going to do. Star Trek don't know how to get somebody somewhere. But Jesus does. So you got the mystery, the rapture of the church, the moment. Nobody knows when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And it's going to happen so fast nobody left behind is going to understand what happened. They'll just be there. Then there's number three, the missing. The missing. The mystery, the moment, and the missing. Who's missing? Well, first, the dead in Christ are missing. Because they went first, didn't they? They come out of the grave first, didn't they? So they're missing. They're gone. Somebody, the, 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 mom and daddy tried to teach them, grandma and grandpa tried to teach them all their life about Jesus. Tried to drag them off to church and get them right with God and get them safe. And they didn't listen. They didn't believe. They didn't have time for all that religious foolishness and them old-fashioned ways and that gospel preaching fell up there. They didn't have time for none of that. They're going to stroll over to Mama and Papa or Mama and Daddy's grave and see what's going on, see if they can figure this thing out because they still remember some of that teaching they heard and Mama and Daddy, Grandma and Grandpa's grave going to be it. Not going to be no help there. It's going to be empty because the dead in Christ will be missing. Because they go first. And then those that are alive and remain, what is that? The alive in Christ. There's a lot of dead in Christ walking the earth today. There's a lot of dead in Christ sitting in churches today. The Bible says those that are alive and remain, we ought to be alive in Christ today. Not just taking up space. Not just marking time. I, I, I said this Wednesday night, and I, I'll say it again today. We're fixing to find out who's real and who's not real. Because you already got people that's decided, you know, I just ain't going back to church. It's easier to sit at the house and watch it on TV. I, I'm beginning to wonder if I want to keep being a TV preacher or not. I, I, I want to bless our seniors and our shut-ins. You know, we might figure out a way to do it on our own website where you got to have a code to be able to watch it. Because too many people want to get lazy on God. And that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that we all not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But when we see the day approaching, when we see this rapture, this second coming, these signs that talk about the end days. When we see those things approaching, the Bible says we ought to go to church more. Yeah. But we got people now that just want to go less and less. Want to go less and less. Well, preacher, you need to be nice to them. You. Why? I wouldn't have liked to have told my granddaddy. Uh, uh, my grandma was a lot of times, I wish you'd be a little nicer to me. <laughs> How do you think that would have worked? <laughs> you know. You've got to get people's attention sometimes. Jesus didn't pull any punches when he preached. He wasn't slack when he preached. He just told the truth. He just told it like it was. Matter of fact, he said this, repent or perish. In other words, get right or die and go to hell. That's what he said. I'm not making it up. Go there and Matthew and look at it. 
Repent ye therefore, or ye shall all likewise perish. You're going to die just like them if you don't repent. You see? They're alive in Christ. I, 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 I'm ready to go, uh, and I am going on this trip. I hope you're ready to go, and I hope you'll be going when it's time to go. I hope you're not worried about what's going to take place when you die. If you, if you, we were talking about this outside before it started raining, we had to move in. If you're a Christian, if you claim to be a Christian here today, there is no, and I can understand nobody wants to go today, okay? I understand that. But if the doctor walked in and said, well, you got terminal disease, we're all going to die. We all got a terminal disease. It's called sin. You just have the joy of knowing that you better tighten up and realize what's important because you know six months, six weeks, or whatever they, you know, can, can tell you, then you kind of got an idea. Well, if I don't have a heart attack, I can live with this disease, whatever it is I got, for another six months or six years. The rest of us don't have the benefit of that luxury. We could die today. We don't know it. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not trying to make light of anything. I'm just trying to help you understand. We're, we're all going to die, and we should never fear death. A Christian should never fear. I, you want to scare me with heaven and with Jesus and being reunited with my friends and family that have already gone on before, to be there for all eternity in his presence? That don't scare me. I, I don't want to leave my wife and kids. Got the oldest fishing to get married. You know, Lord willing, he, they may get married and, and, and the Lord may let this thing play out long enough. I might have a grandkid one day. I don't know. But I'm not scared to die. If the Lord leave me here long enough to see all that, that'll be great. But if he don't, that's fine. I'm not going to get all bent out of shape about it. If I get to call, some of my preacher friends, they've had to call. They're, they're going, through tri going through all this stuff. Oh, one of them, buddy, I'm telling you, the sufferings of Job, I don't understand. But that one preacher in the last two or three years, has it been, how long has he had that? I mean, this knocked on death's door once or twice. And they were able to do this, give him a little longer. Do a little more, give him a little longer. Then he was in remission, everything was fine. And then that boy's back now, you know, and seeking something else. The ups and the downs of all. I understand that. But every day, he'll put a little good word out there. Trusting in the Lord. Not fretting. Not fearing. Not worrying. God's got it under control. It's all in his hands. It doesn't matter. That's how a Christian ought to live every day of their life. Whether they got a prognosis or not. Because we know where our future is. We know that our eternity is secure. That, that's the missing. The mystery, the moment, the missing. The dead in Christ, the alive in Christ. Then one last thing here. The mess and the messed up. The mess and the messed up. Number four. There's going to be a global confusion and a global chaos. You think this pandemic is bad, there's going to be paranoia that sets in as soon as this happens. There's going to be pandemonium that takes place as soon as this happens. People say, well, what about this seven years? Well, we'll get to that in another lesson. There's a short period of time here before this seven years ever starts. Well, how do you know that, preacher? Thought it's just seven years. It is. But there's this thing uh, called, this man called the Antichrist that has to come on the scene. And why does he come on the scene? Because of all this mess and all this chaos that's going on in the world. I, I, I don't know, you know, if we, if we had visual aids, I still don't even know if that would work. 
But can you just imagine in your mind that you're driving down the road and all of a sudden cars just start going every direction, crashing into things. That you're out on the cruise ship in the middle of the ocean somewhere and people disappear and the captain and the crew's gone. You think everybody on that boat knows how to drive a big boat? Airplanes in the air. Pilots is Christian. First mates are Christian. Half the stewardess Christians. Half the people on the plane Christians. You think somebody's going to land that plane? That thing's going to fall out of the sky. What if it falls out of the sky in a major populated city? Like we saw those airplanes crash in them buildings in New York a few years ago. Do you understand? Chaos. Pandemonium. Global chaos. Global pandemonium. It's going to happen all over the world. I mean, it's going to be a mess. And the ones that are left behind are going to be messed up. Here's why. Some of them ain't got a clue what's going on. They, they, they don't have any idea what's going on. Then there's two other kind of people. There's, there's the lost people that follow Satan and the occult. You know, there's just generally lost people. They're good folks. There's a lot of them, like I say, that you know. A lot of them go to church, but they're lost. They're good people, but they're lost. They just not gonna know what's happening, what's going on. They're gonna be confused. The devil's crowd, the ones that follow him, them not so much. Because the devil's crowd and the occult have already started teaching about an event that's going to take place on this earth called the Great Perfecting. Where millions of people disappear off the face of the earth because the ascended master is going to send judgment to the earth. But there's a certain group of people on the earth that can't endure the judgment, so the ascended master is going to call them out so that the earth can undergo that, that time of judgment and purging. That's Satan explaining the rapture to his people. That, oh, we're going to be fine. We can stay here and endure it. But there's a weak group that can't endure it, and they're going to disappear. So there'll be some that, that they think that's what's happening. Then there's going to be those that really genuinely thought they were saved and they were Christians, that they had their ticket punched and they were going to heaven, and they're going to be the most messed up out of the whole bunch because they're going to lose their mind. They're literally going to lose their mind. You say, well, won't they have a chance? No, they won't have a chance because once it takes place, that's over with. They'll believe the lie. They'll, they'll be so mentally incapacitated. They'll be so messed up that eventually they'll fall for the lie and they'll believe the lie. Now, we'll talk about what takes place in the tribulation and whether somebody can be, become a believer or not. We'll talk about all that when we talk about the tribulation. But this is the last thing. There's a great mystery, this thing called the rapture. It's going to happen in a moment. It's going to happen so fast you won't know it's happening. It's going to happen so fast you can't say, well, preacher, I'm going to live right up to it, and then I'll say, Lord, save me. It'll, be, it'll happen faster than you can say that. It'll happen faster than you can think that. That's how fast it'll happen. And then there'll be people missing. And then there'll be the mess and the messed up. And globalism will set in and take over. And once that takes place, then you're set up for the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. Don't be part of the missed out crowd. Don't be part of the messed up crowd. Don't hang around for the mess. You ought to know for sure today beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're going when the Lord calls. How can I know? It's not difficult. It's, it's, there's, there's not one thing that you have to do. You, you, can't, you can't work your way to it. Jesus said, suffer not the little children. He said, unless we come, unless we older folks come with that simple 
childlike faith. In other words, if you've got to figure it out and reason it, you don't have it. If you have to reason it in your mind and figure it out in your mind, you don't have it. Because that's not by faith. By faith, you simply say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Because you know you are. If you're sitting in this building today, you know you're a sinner. And if you don't, I'll tell you right now, you are because you got an element of pride, and pride is sin. So you're, you're proud that you're not a sinner, so you're a sinner. The first step is admitting you're a sinner. When you can do that, then you can accept the free gift of salvation that God provided at Calvary. When Jesus died... He was buried. He rose again on the third day to give us eternal life. There's lots of elements to it. But it's just as simple as admitting you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. Why? Because here's the rest of that passage in John 14. He said, If I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. You read down a couple of more verses in verse 6. The Bible says this. I am the way. Thomas is worried. He's doubting. He, and Jesus told him, you know the way and, and all this. And then he just, just plain out so there would be no confusion in the matter. Jesus said, I am the way. Not a way. I am the way. There's only one way. I am the truth. Not a truth or some truth. I'm the only truth. Jesus is the only truth there is. You can't believe nothing that comes out of nobody's mouth. If it didn't come out of that Bible, it's not true. It's not. Unless they quoted it, read it out of that scripture. Not their opinion of it, but what it says, it's not true. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's the other part of that. So how are you going to get to make that trip? You put your faith in him. You put your faith in that, that he made a way, and he's the way. We accept by faith that he made the way for us to be reconciled unto God, for us to be redeemed, for us to be forgiven, justified, cleansed, sanctified. It's done. He did it all at Calvary. It's finished. Nothing we can do to earn it. It wouldn't matter if I preached every day for the rest of my life. wouldn't get me no more brownie points as far as getting to heaven. Because that's not what it takes to get there. All it took was when I was a five-year-old boy, that preacher was preaching. And I said, he's preaching to me. And I need that Jesus he's preaching about. Because at five years old, I was old enough to know I was a bad boy. I didn't do everything I should do. I lied, cheated, and stole all the time. I did. I cried when I wasn't hurt. That's lying. I got mad and pouted when I didn't get my way. You, you, you don't have to go out and commit murder and incest and everything else to be a sinner. All you got to do is be born. And you're a sinner. So at five, he preached and the Holy Ghost sent conviction. And I said, I'm one of those sinners he's talking about. And I need that Savior he's talking about. And I walked down that aisle. That's what you need. I said, I need to be saved. I need to accept I need to tell Jesus I'm a sinner and accept this free gift of salvation that he's offered. It's that simple. And I prayed and told the Lord what I was and I wanted what he had to offer, and it was done deal. Never doubted it, never backed up on it. Sometimes the old devil will come around and tell you you ain't. Try to get you convinced you're not. But when you are, you know it. The Lord changes you. The Lord helps you. The Lord works on you. My wife will tell you after 20-some years, I, I'm not where I need to be by no means. But I'm not the mean old man I was when she met me. If you don't believe me, you ask her after church. The Lord's in the changing business. And if at some point you think you made a decision and you're not sure, you might ought to make sure. Because if you're not changed, if you've not come along, then you probably just trusted in some religion. You didn't develop a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess to him that you're a sinner, that you need a Savior, and he'll save you today. That's the only way you get to go on this trip. 
you, you can't pick and choose. You won't know when it's going to happen. You don't know when you're going to die. You don't know when this rapture is going to take place. The Bible says, behold, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation is what Scripture says. We don't preach that to get results as far as counting numbers. We preach that and we say that because we don't want you to miss it if it happens today. Maybe you've been watching on the camera. Uh, I, I'm used to having a couple of cameras and we are only one today, so I don't even know if you've seen me. I've walked around so much, you might not have kept up. But maybe you're watching and the Lord has spoke to your heart and you think, well, how, how can I do I'm here, I'm wherever you are. He'll be right there with you. And all you have to do is stop right where you are and tell the Lord that you know that you're a sinner and you need a Savior, and He'll save you. Maybe you're listening on the radio today. Hopefully we, we've made it there and the feed's still good on the radio. If you're listening on the radio, wherever you are, you don't want to miss this rapture. You don't want to die without Jesus. You want to be one of the dead in Christ, not one of the dead without Christ. Right where you are, just beside that radio, maybe you're driving, listening. If you're driving, don't kneel down, don't close your eyes. If you're driving, you just hold on the steering wheel. Tell Jesus that you know you're a sinner and you need a Savior. He'll save you. It's that simple. He's never denied anybody. Never turned anybody away. You ain't got to worry about your credit score, your bank account, or anything else. All you got to do is know you're a sinner. And he'll accept you just like you are. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had to gather together today. Thank you, Lord, that uh, even though we tried to be outside, uh, we moved inside. Lord, I pray that today that you'll strengthen our faith in you. I pray, God, that you'll... Unite us as a group of people and help us to see and understand that we have one goal, and that's to tell everybody we can about how much Jesus loves them. And Lord, as we're doing that, we're to grow in our faith. We're to grow in you and to grow closer to you as we tell other people about you. And Lord, maybe today somebody's been listening, maybe in this building, maybe watching through the video feeds, maybe listening on the radio. God, there's somebody that doesn't know you out there. If that rapture took place today, they'd miss it. God, the Holy Spirit is speaking to their heart. I, I can't do anything for them. But God, you can. Help them to know and to understand all they have to do is acknowledge to you that they know they're a sinner. That they need the free gift that Jesus offered because of what he did at Calvary. And you'll extend that gift of grace and mercy to them. And they can have the peace in their heart. Lord, it, it just as quick as I've said it, Lord, I believe somebody took it. I believe that there's somebody somewhere that's watching or listening. Lord, they just accepted that gift of your salvation. Lord, we thank you for what you do. Thank you that you continually offer that. Lord, when, when the world is so dead set against you and it mocks you and it makes fun of you and it belittles you and, and Lord, Christians, we, we don't even give people a reason sometimes to want you by the way we live our life, by our attitudes and our frustrations and, and our anger and, and our hatred and, and our snide remarks and some of the things that we do. But God, in spite of that, the Holy Spirit moves in people's hearts. Lord, we thank you that you're patient and long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Lord, thank you for those that have believed today. I know somebody somewhere out there. I felt it when I said it. Lord, they became a Christian today. Let them know that we love them and that we want to pray for them. And Lord, if they'll just reach out and contact us somehow, phone, email, a letter, whatever. Lord, we'll do our best to try to help them grow as a Christian, to, to help them understand what it means and, and how, how you would want them to live and be able to share their testimony with others. Lord, there's maybe somebody in this building today that they need that very same thing. 
God, would you just give them the strength and the courage to pray that same prayer, to just tell you, Lord, that they know they're a sinner. They need a Savior today. God, you'll save them as well. And if they do that, Lord, would you just give them the courage to maybe come to me or go to someone else after the service and let them know, hey, I did what that preacher said, and I became a Christian. I asked Jesus to save me today. I accepted that gift. What do I do now? Lord, just give them that courage, and Lord, we'll try to help them walk beside them and, and, and teach them as a Christian, Lord, uh, what the Lord would want them to do next. We love you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. All those that are Christians here this morning that have been walking the walk of faith, Lord, down through the years, been serving you faithful. I thank you for them. I pray that you'll continue to strengthen them, Lord. And may this message encourage their heart to know that our labor is not in vain. That, God, we walk and we talk and we expect that one day we're going to hear that shout. We're going to hear that voice and that trumpet sound. And we'll see you for who you are. And we'll be with you for all eternity. Lord, yes, there's heartaches and there's headaches and there's ups and downs in life. James told us we ought to rejoice in those manifold temptations. God, that you've called us to be able to suffer on your behalf. Lord, may Jesus see somebody in what we go through and in the things that we endure. That's our sole purpose. Lord, we love you. Thank you again for meeting with us today. I pray that you'll keep us safe as we depart. Lord, help our nation. Lord, it, it's in a position now, uh, Lord, to be so easily divided. But God, I pray that, that Lord, you'd just give uh, churches and pastors wisdom and give their people faith, Lord, to stand with you and stand in you in this whole thing so that we can show the world that we don't have to live in fear, that we serve an awesome God, a God that's able a God that can take care and take control of anything that's going on on this earth. God, would you just help us to be bold in that. Not belligerent, but bold. God, help us to be thoughtful. Help us to be kind and caring as we go about our business. But Lord, help us to pray for our nation. And that God, this thing would get straightened out. And Lord, people would come to their senses. And Lord, uh, quit, quit fear mongering among the people. Just help us as we leave. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.